sure you have them very much in mind. To summarize some of the things that we talked about and put it in perspective, we talked about a police department who from the very beginning was more interested in themselves and their image, and that carried through. We talked about socks that appeared all of a sudden that weren't there, socks where evidence was planted on them. We talked about police officers who lie with impunity, where the oath doesn't mean anything to them. We talked about messengers where you couldn't trust the message. We talked about gloves that didn't fit, a knit cap that wouldn't make any difference, a prosecution scenario that is unbelievable and unreasonable. In short, we talked about reasonable doubt. We talked about something that's made this country great, that you can be accused in this country of a crime. But that's just an accusation. And when you enter a not guilty plea, since the beginning of the time of this country, since the time of the Magna Carta, that sets the forces in motion, and you have a trial. That's what this has been about. That's why we love what we do. An opportunity to come before people from the community, the consciences of the community. You are the consciences of this community. You set the standards. You tell us what's right and wrong. You set the standards. You use your common sense to do that. Your verdict goes far beyond these doors of this courtroom. As Mr. Darden said, the whole world is watching and waiting for your decision in this case. That's not to put any pressure on you. Just tell you what's really happening out there. So we talked about all of those things. Hopefully in a logical way. Hopefully something I said made some sense to you. Hopefully as an advocate, you know my zeal. You know the passion I feel for this. We've all got time invested in this case. But it's just not about winning. It's about what's right. It's about a man's life at stake here. So in Voidar, you promised to take the time that was necessary, and you've more than done that. Remember, I asked you, though, that when you got down to the end of the case, when you kept all your promises about coming here every day and taking these notes and paying attention and, you know, listening to us drone on and on and on, that pretty soon it would be in your hands. And then you couldn't just rush through that, could you? Now, we tried to make it a little more simple with regard to the issues, but still, we're going to have 12 minds coming together, 12 open minds. 12 unbiased minds to come together on these issues, and you will give it, I'm sure, the importance to which it's entitled. Please don't compromise your principles or your consciences in rendering this decision. Don't, don't rush to judgment. Don't compound what they've already done in this case. Don't rush to judgment. Have a judgment that is well thought out, one that you can Believe in the morning after this verdict. I want you to place yourself the day after you render the verdict. When you get up and you look in the mirror and you're free, you're no longer sequestered. You probably look for each other, but you know, you'll, you'll be happy to be home again. But what's important is look in that mirror and say, have I been true to my oath? Did I do the right thing? Was I naive? Was I timid? Or was I courageous? Did I believe in the Constitution? Did I believe in justice? Did I do my part for integrity and honesty? That's the mission you're on in this journey toward justice. And now, yesterday I touched briefly on some of Mr. Darden's argument, and we talked a little bit about the fact of his contention about motive. We talked about his analogy about a fuse, and I referred to him as Dr. Darden with regard to what he had to say, and I thought I just would 
summarize briefly this morning a response to what he had to say and what he tried to weave together. As I said, he talked about an incident in 1985, an unfortunate incident between two people who were married. There was no arrest. There was no physical violence. The one incident in 89, the one he's not proud of, the one he wrote those letters about, the one he apologized for and said he was sorry. And there is no physical violence after that. In the 1993 call, the 911 call, you listen to that entire tape when they cut it off. You'll remember that it's unfortunate when anyone has an argument. But you listen carefully to what Mr. Simpson is arguing about, what he's talking about, and what the discussion is about. Mrs. Simpson mentions the children. And he says, you weren't worried about the children when you were doing so-and-so on the couch. It's pretty graphic, but any man or woman would be upset over what he's talking about on that tape. There was no physical violence. There's no excuse for him kicking the back door. But by the end, you remember what Cato Kalin said and what the police officer said. They resolved this matter. It was an argument. It was loud and raucous, and they moved on. There was no fuse after that. And this was during a time, you'll recall, that in January of 1992, when they first agreed to separate, you don't hear anything about a dispute. When Mr. Cole Brown Simpson moved out, there was not any question about a dispute. When she got this divorce at the end of 92, there was no dispute. They're both dating other people. He's with Paula Barbieri for that like whole year. And then you know it wasn't Mr. Simpson who pursued Mrs. Simpson. It was her who wanted to get back with those kids. You heard Arnell Simpson, and then they agreed. But he put some provisos on that. She couldn't move back in that house. She still kept her own house. Now, who is controlling whom? Who is pursuing whom when he talks about fuse? There is no fuse. They get back together, and they try to make it work. It lasts for almost a year. My learned friend has the dates all wrong. It's around Mother's Day when they break up. You remember, there's testimony from Cato Kalin about a pediatric AIDS affair. Where Paula Barbieri goes with O.J. Simpson. It's the early part of May. After Mother's Day, after they break up. With the kids, Sidney and Justin. Now we know they'd been friends, even when they broke up their friends. You know how you know that? Remember the barber, Juanita Moore. Nice lady who came in here and talked about O.J. Simpson not having dandruff, not having treated hair. She says she came to the house in the first part of May and there was Nicole there over at O.J. Simpson's house. There's no fuse. Then they go on later that month. They break up, even after being broken up. What does Arnell tell you? That when Nicole gets sick, none of these other people which she may be seeing or whatever, it's O.J. taking her soup, trying to help out. Now you do that for your ex-wife or your ex-boyfriend or whatever. There's no fuse. There's no strings attached to that. He goes on with his life because now he's back with Paula. We've been with the year before, and he didn't. And Miss Clark tried to get Cato Kalen to ask, didn't he take Paula someplace in the summer of 93 when she knew they were now back together? And Cato says, no, I don't think so, because they made this arrangement to date each other exclusively. And that's what happened, you see. And so we get all the way back past May into June, and there is no trigger, there is no fuse, there's nothing going on. The only fuse, the only trigger is in Mr. Darden's mind. The evidence isn't there, and they spent all this time about motive. There is none. There were two people who divorced. The case was settled, they had their homes, they moved on. Christian Reichardt tells you that night he was happier than he'd been for a long time because he got his life together and moved on. And so, I just wanted you to put that in perspective. And if that wasn't enough, you look at that video of June 12th and the photograph of him with his daughter, and you see whether or not this is a happy man who's just getting on with his life. So when he rhetorically asked the question, why didn't we call Lenore Walker? I say back to him, 
Why didn't you call Lenore Walker? She had something bad to say about O.J. Simpson. It wasn't necessary. It wasn't necessary. It wasn't necessary. As you know, we could be here forever, calling one witness after the other. Sooner or later, you were going to revolt, and I wouldn't blame you. Mr. Darden agrees we had to cut it off at some point. So I hope that. When you look about this so-called board of abuse and they have things about a divorce and things up there, you put this in perspective. Absence of motive tends to establish innocence. That's what the jury instruction says. Evidence of other offenses are introduced for a very limited portion in this case. And the bottom line is, the positive things in this man's life. The good days far outweigh the bad days, and in your life, in all of our lives, we just hope at the end, when we must ultimately meet our makers, that the good days have outweighed the bad days. And in this marriage, the lasting monuments and memorials to this marriage are these two beautiful children. They had more good days than bad days by all of the evidence. These two people love their children. They may have gone separate ways, but they love their children. That's why he was back in town to go to that recital, that recital where there's so many people where it's in this auditorium where Nicole Brown Simpson gets his tickets. You know, that's why they're talking in the afternoon to make arrangements, and she is the one who holds a seat for him. This is what happened on that date. This isn't about any argument. This is a family thing. So Mr. Darden wants to make a big thing and says, well, he had to go out to dinner with Cato. He had to catch a plane. See the evidence for what it is. Understand these things. Put them in perspective. And so, you use your common sense. There is no fuse with regard to that. It's important for you to know that. Take a look at that video when you're back there. Take a look at all of the evidence. In this case, Ms. Clark in her argument on several occasions said that Mr. Simpson was cut on his razor sharp cell phone. Well, it's not what the evidence is, is it? It's not what was said. I read you what Dr. Batten said about that. And so we can use these words, but let's, let's hopefully be accurate as we try to say those things. Now let's go back to where we were when we broke last night. We had started talking about the messengers in this case. We talked briefly about Van Adder and about all of his big lies. His lies become very important because he's the co-lead investigator in this case. From the very beginning, he was lying to you. And it was interesting. When I thought about this last night, after I left you, just about 10 days ago, a week or 10 days ago, Van Adder took that stand again, and you saw him. You had a chance to again observe his demeanor, and you're smart. You, you know when somebody's lying and not telling you the truth. I mean, I don't have to go into that. You, you know, you don't need the jury instruction. You've got this visceral reaction. You've got your experiences in life, and you know somebody who's lying, but you know, he said something really interesting. It was really preposterous when you think about it. He said, Mr. Shapiro, Mr. O.J. Simpson was no more a suspect than you were. Now, now who in here believed that? Did he really think he's gonna come back in here and we were gonna believe that, that O.J. Simpson was no more a suspect than Robert Shapiro? That's what he told you. Big lies. You can't trust him. You can't believe anything that he says because it goes to the core of this case. When you're lying at the beginning, you'll be lying at the end. The book of Luke talks about that. It talks about if you're untruthful in small things, you should be disbelieved in big things. There's no question about that. We've known that all along. So this man, with his big lies, and then we have Furman coming right on the heels, and the two of them need to be paired together because they are twins of deception. Furman and Van Adder, twins of deception, who bring you a message that you cannot trust, that you cannot trust. 
Let's continue on where we left off then with this man, Furman, who says some very interesting thing in the course of his testimony. And as we talked about Van Anner's big lies, we have Furman's big lies. The Van Adder, the man who carried the blood. Furman, the man who found the glove. You recall that he was asked, because I read you yesterday briefly, the question well phrased by Lee Bailey, have you ever used this N-word in 10 years? It went right back to 85. And he picked that 85 date, you know why? Because of the Kathleen Bell letter, just like they knew about it. Picked that date. So he knew he was lying. Honed in on him. You know, liars can be tricky. And so he was, at that point, trying to pin it down for you. 10 years, 85 to 95. This was like in February of this year. Says also he never met Kathleen Bell, this Marine Center. Tells you that Rokar, the photographer, took this photograph after 7 o'clock in the morning. I remember that. Look back through your notes. And the reason he tells you that because he wants that photograph of him pointing at the glove taken after he supposedly finds the glove at Rockingham. Now, you may not have caught that right at the beginning when this was happening. He says he took the photograph at Rockingham after 7 o'clock a.m. after they returned from Rockingham. You know, they all go over to Bundy after 5 o'clock. Strike that. At Bundy, they all go over to Rockingham at five o'clock from five to seven. And so it becomes very, very important as we look at this photograph in a few minutes. Rogar then comes here near the end of the case. There's been nobody called to refute him in rebuttal. and says, these photographs on this contact sheet are all taken while it's dark. He says he could tell the difference in a photograph taken an hour and a half before sunrise, 541, 542, and an hour and a half afterwards. So then why then is this big liar in the crime scene with access to the glove and the hat? Why is he down there pointing at this glove where he's walking and all in the blood and everything when he wants you to believe it's seven o'clock? Now we know it's not seven o'clock. See that photograph up there? That is Mark Furman pointing. You see the envelope pointing under this neatly arranged cap and glove supposedly just happened to fall right under that bush in that fashion. That's what you're asked to believe. There he is pointing at it. Well now, let me tell you why this is important. You recognize Furman, personification of evil. When he's doing that, he's trying to tell you this is some important piece of evidence here. And I just came back from Rockingham. This matches the glove found over there. That's what he tells you. But he's lying again. He's lying, and that's why he's central to this case, because he hadn't even been to Rockingham at that point, and he's tracking in that blood at that point. And that becomes very important, because you remember he slips up and says, in the Bronco at some point. Did he get in that Bronco? Did he put a bloody footprint in that Bronco? Are his shoes size 12? He talks about in the Bronco. He talks about them, remember? It was a question he was asked about gloves, and Lee Bailey asked him about, well, he says, well, he's talking about gloves, and he says, them. Never explained that. When he says them, them, does that mean two gloves? He said, I saw them. Is that two gloves? Why would you say them? He's intelligent enough to come and lie to you. So, that picture, that photograph there, that seals their doom. That seals their doom. This man, who in 85, in his mind, started this. This man, who's asked to go over and help O.J. Simpson to notify him and take care of the kids. This man, this perjurer, this racist, this genocidal racist, this is the man. And he says then, inferentially he didn't plant the glove, but now we know about these photographs when they were taken. And you look, you'll have that contact sheet, and you'll see the photograph of Mr. Cole Brown Simpson, and the last two on this roll, taken at nighttime with the flash at 4.30 or so in the morning. Why else is this important? 
because they're going to tell you, well, he didn't have an opportunity to get the glove or get access to anything. Remember, they brought, brought all these police officers in here, including Lieutenant Spangler, to say, well, you know, we were just watching Furman the whole time. First of all, you knew that was a lie at the beginning. Why would anybody be necessarily watching him? They're always covering for him anyway. But we knew that wasn't true because when Rokar got there, shortly after 3 o'clock, Rokar goes to that back alley and he sees Risky, who's back there then. Remember, Rokar sees Risky in the back alley. Rokar doesn't even see Furman for like a half hour after he gets there, he says. Then all of a sudden, Furman shows up. Where has he been? What's he been doing? And then Risky is out in the front of Bundy there. And Risky testifies about the taking of this photograph. He wants to place the time later, but he said it's before the sun comes up, before daylight. That has to be, because we've stipulated to it, before 541. So inadvertently, he corroborates Rokar. But Rokar knows because he took these photographs. Why then, ladies and gentlemen, is he pointing at this glove when he hasn't even been over there? Why then would they try to tell you he doesn't have time at Bundy when he's by himself for this period of time? He's not with any Spangler. He's walking around by himself. Why then is he walking in that crime scene and why does he lie to you and said he didn't have access to the crime scene? Now these are the facts. These are the facts, I haven't made them up. This is what you heard in this case. This is what we've proven. Some of it came in late, some of it came in early. But our job here is to piece this together so that you can then see this. So when he refers to the gloves as them, that's never been cleared up for you, and it can't. It's a Freudian slip. When he talks about in the Bronco, and there was a dispute, well, did he really say that? Remember the tape was played, the preliminary hearing, and his voice was heard saying, in the Bronco. You can see all these things. He's strolling down to Rockingham. The big man, figuring a way to do this, to carry out this plan, this thought he has in his mind since 1985, to make the big score. And so Rokar severely impeaches Furman about these photographs. And once again, these photographs speak a thousand words. Concluding about Risky, he said on cross-examination that the photograph pointing at the glove was taken at least 40 minutes before daylight. The sun rose at 541, maybe a little bit late, but it was before daylight. And so we know that. That's now clear. Why did they then all try to cover for this man, Furman? Why would this man who is not only Los Angeles' worst nightmare, but America's worst nightmare. Why would they all turn their heads and try to cover for him? Why would you do that if you're sworn to uphold the law? There is something about corruption. There's something about a rotten apple that will ultimately infect the entire barrel. Because if the others don't have the courage that we've asked you to have in this case, people sit silently by. We live in a society where many people are apathetic. They don't want to get involved. And that's why all of us to a person in this courtroom have thanked you from the bottom of our hearts. Because you know what? You haven't been apathetic. You're the ones who made a commitment, a commitment toward justice. And it's a painful commitment, but you gotta see it through. Your commitment, your courage, is much greater than these police officers. This man could have been off the force long ago if they'd done their job, but they didn't do their job. People looked the other way. People didn't have the courage. One of the things that's made this country so great is people's willingness to stand up and say, that's wrong, I'm not gonna be part of it. I'm not gonna be part of the cover-up. That's what I'm asking you to do. Stop this cover-up. Stop this cover-up. If you don't stop it, then who? You think the police department's gonna stop it? You think the DA's office is gonna stop it? 
Do you think we can stop it by ourselves? It has to be stopped by you. And you know, they talked about Furman. They talked about him in derisive tones now. And that's very fashionable now, isn't it? Everybody wants to beat up on Furman. The favorite whipping boy in America. I told you, I don't take any delight in that. Because you know before this trial started, if you grow up in this country, you know there are Furmans out there. You learn early on in your life that you're not going to be naive. That you love your country, but you know it's not perfect. So you understand that. So it's no surprise to me. But I don't take any pride in it. But for some of you, you're finding out the other side of life. You're finding out that's why this case is so instructive. You're finding out about the other side of life. The things aren't always as they seem. It's not just rhetoric. It's the actions of people. It's the lack of courage and the lack of integrity at high places. That's what we're talking about here. Credibility doesn't attach to a title or position. It attaches to the person. So the person who may have a job where he makes $2 an hour can have more integrity than the highest person. It's something from within. It's in your heart. It's what the Lord has put there. That's what we're talking about in this case. And so why don't they speak out? Why do they take him to their breast? Compare how our prosecutors treat Furman as opposed to Cato Kalin. Look at how they treated Mark Partridge as opposed to Cato Kalin. Look at how they embraced him. And now they want to distance themselves. These same people say, oh, he's not important. But the Rokar photograph puts the lie to that. He is very important. And what becomes so important when we talk about these two twin demons of evil, Van Adder and Furman, is the jury instruction which you know about now. And it says essentially that a witness willfully false. I think Mr. Douglas is gonna put that up for us. A witness willfully false in one material part of his or her testimony is to be distrusted in others. You may reject the whole testimony of a witness who willfully has testified falsely to a material point, unless from all the evidence you believe the probability of truth favors his or her testimony in other particulars. Why is this instruction so important? We got the bullet points up there. First of all, both prosecutors have now agreed that we have convinced them, beyond a reasonable doubt, by the way, He's a lying, perjuring, genocidal racist. And he's testified willfully false in this case on a number of scores. That's what his big lies tell you. And when you go back in the jury room, some of you may want to say that, well, gee, you know, boys will be boys. Uh, this is just like police talk. This is the way they talk. That's not acceptable as the consciences of this community. If you adopt that attitude, that's why we have this. Because nobody has had the courage to say it's wrong. You are empowered to say we're not going to take that anymore. I'm sure you'll do the right thing about that. So that what you then, it seems to me, must do is you have the authority. You may reject the whole testimony. You can then wipe out everything that Furman told you, including the glove and all the things he recovered the glove. That's why they're so worried. That's why when people say Furman is not central, they're wearing blinders. They've lost their objectivity. They don't understand what they're talking about. It's embarrassing for learned people to say that but they're entitled to their opinions, but we're gonna speak the truth in a courtroom. You are supposed to speak the truth. A witness who walks through those doors, who raises his or her hand, swears to tell the truth. You've heard lie after lie after lie that's been exposed. And when a witness lies 
in a material part of his testimony, you can wipe out all of his testimony as a judge of the facts. That's your decision again. Nobody can tell you about that unless you feel that the greater probability of truth lies in something else they said. Wipe it out. This applies not only to Furman, it applies to Van Adder, and then you see what trouble that case is in. Because they lied to get in there to do these things. When Van Adder carries that blood, they can't explain to you why he did that. Because they were setting this man up. And that glove, anybody among you think that glove was just sitting there, just placed there, moist and sticky after six and a half hours. The testimony is it would be dried in three or four hours, according to McDonald. We're not naive. You understand? There's no blood on anything else. There's no blood trail. There's no hair and fiber. And you get the ridiculous explanation that Mr. Sepps was running into an air conditioning on his own property. Anybody else? All right, the record reflect that we now have our complete jury panel. Mr. Carpenter. Thank you. Nice time, my brother. is willfully false. One material part distrusted in others. These two form basically the cornerstone of the prosecution's case. Now, you know, people talk all the time, well, you know, you're being conspiratorial and whatever. Gee, why would all these police officers set up O.J. Simpson? Why would they do that? I'll answer that question for you. They believed he was guilty. They wanted to win. They didn't want to lose another big case. That's why they believed he was guilty. These actions rose from what their belief was. But they can't make that judgment. The prosecutors can't make that judgment. Nobody but you can make that judgment. So when they take the law into their own hands, they become worse than the people who break the law because they are the protectors of the law. Who then polices the police? You police the police. You police them by your verdict. You're the ones who send the message. Nobody else is gonna do it in this society. They don't have the courage. Nobody has the courage. You have a bunch of people running around with no courage to do what is right. Except individual citizens. You're the ones in war. You're the ones who are on the front line. These people set policies, these people talk all this stuff. You implement it. You're the people. You're what makes America so great. And don't you forget it. And so, understand how this happened. It's part of a culture of getting away with things. It's part of a culture looking the other way. Of we determine the rules as we go along. Nobody's gonna question us. We're the LAPD. And so you take these two twins of deception. And if, as you can, under this law, wipe out their testimony, the prosecutors realize their case then is in serious trouble. From risky to bushy. They came together in this case because they want to win. But it's not about them winning. It's about justice being done. They'll have other cases this is this man's one life that's entrusted, or will be soon, to you. So when we talked about this evidence being compromised, contaminated, and corrupted, some people didn't believe that. Have we proved that? Have we proved that it was compromised, contaminated, and corrupted? And yes, even something more sinister? I think you'll agree we did. But there's something else about this man, Furman, that I have to say before I'm going to terminate this part of my opening argument and relinquish the floor to my learned colleague, Mr. Barry Sheck. 
is something that Furman said, and I'm going to ask Mr. Douglas and Mr. Harris to put up that Kathleen Bell letter. You know, it's one thing, and I dare say that most of you, when you heard Furman say he hadn't used the N-word, that you probably thought, well, he's lying. We know that's not true. That's just part of it, and that's what the prosecutors want to just talk about, that part of it. It's not the part that bothers us on the defense. I live in America. I understand. I know about slights every day of my life. But I want to tell you about what is troubling, what is frightening, what is chilling about that Kathleen Bell letter. Let's see if we can see part of it. And I think you will agree. So I want to put the focus back where it belongs on this letter and its application to this case. You'll recall that God is good and he always bring you a way to see light when there's a lot of darkness around. And just through chance, this lady had tried to reach Shapiro's office, couldn't reach it. And in July of 1994, she sent this fax to my office and my good, loyal and wonderful staff got that letter to me early on. And this was one you just couldn't pass up. You get a lot of letters, but you couldn't pass this one up because she says some interesting things. And she wasn't a fan of O.J. Simpson's. What does she say? I'm writing to you in regards to a story I saw on the news last night. I thought it ridiculous that the Simpson defense team would even suggest that there might be racial motivation involved in the trial against Mr. Simpson. Yes, there are a lot of people out there who thought that at that time. And you know, you, you can't fault people for being naive. But once they know, if they continue to be naive, then you can fault them. That's what it is, and that's why this case is important. Don't ever say again in this county or in this country that you don't know things like this exist. Don't pretend to be naive anymore. Don't turn your heads. Stand up. Show some integrity. And so I then glanced up at the television and was quite shocked to see that Officer Furman was a man that I had the misfortune of meeting. You may have received a message from your answering service last night that I called to say that Mr. Furman may be more of a racist than you could even imagine. I doubt that, but... At any rate, it was something that got my attention. Between 1985 and 1986, I worked as a real estate agent in Redondo Beach for Century 21 Bob Mayher Realty, now out of business. At the time, my office was located above a marine recruiting center off of Pacific Coast Highway. On occasion, I would stop in to say hello to the two Marines working there. I saw Mr. Furman there a couple of times. I remember him distinctly because of his height and bill. You know, he's tall. While speaking to the man, I learned that Mr. Furman was a police officer in Westwood. Isn't that interesting? Just exactly the place where Laura McKinney met him. And I don't know if he was telling the truth, but he said that he'd been in the Special Division of the Marines. I don't know how the subject was raised. But Officer Furman said that when he sees a nigger, as he called it, driving with a white woman, he would pull them over. I ask, what if he didn't have a reason? And he said that he would find one. I looked at the two Marines to see if they knew he was joking, but it became obvious to me that he was very serious. Now, let me just stop at this point. Back it up a minute, Mr. Harris. Pull it back down, please. If he sees an African-American with a white woman, he would stop them. If he didn't have a reason, he'd find one or make up one. This man will lie to set you up. That's what he's saying there. He will do anything to set you up because of the hatred he has in his heart. 
A racist is somebody who has power over you, who can do something to you. People can have views, they keep them to themselves. But when they have power over you, that's when racism becomes insidious. That's what we're talking about here. He has power. A police officer in the street, a patrol officer, is the single most powerful figure in the criminal justice system. He can take your life. Unlike the Supreme Court, you don't have to go through all these appeals. He can do it right there and justify it. And that's why, that's why this has to be rooted out in the LAPD and every place else. Make up a reason. Because he made a judgment. That's what happened in this case. They made a judgment. Everything else after that was going to point toward O.J. Simpson. They didn't want to look at anybody else. Mr. Darden asked, who did this crime? That's their job as the police. We've been hampered. They turned down our offers for help. But that's the prosecution's job. The judge says, we don't have that job. The law says that. We'd love to help do that. Who do you think wants to find these murderers more than Mr. Simpson? But that's not our job. It's their job. And when they don't talk to anybody else, when they rush to judgment in their obsession to win, that's why this became a problem. This man had the power to carry out his racist views. And that's what's so troubling. Let's move on. Making up a reason. That's troubling. That's frightening. That's chilling. But if that wasn't enough, if that wasn't enough, the thing that really gets you, is she goes on to say, Officer Furman went on to say, that he would like nothing more than to see all niggers gathered together and killed. He said something about burning, burning them or bombing them. I was too shaken to remember the exact words he used. However, I do remember that what he said was probably the most horrible thing I'd ever heard someone say what frightened me even more was that he was a police officer sworn to uphold the law and now we have it there was another man not too long ago in the world who had those same views who wanted to burn people who had racist views and ultimately had power over people in his country. People didn't care. People said he's just crazy, he's just a half-baked painter. And they didn't do anything about it. This man, this scourge became one of the worst people in the history of this world, Adolf Hitler. Because people didn't care, didn't try to stop him. He had the power over his racism and his anti-religionism. Nobody wanted to stop him, and it ended up in World War II, the conduct of this man. And so, Furman, Furman, was to take all black people now and burn them, or bomb them. That's genocidal racism. Is that ethnic purity? What is that? What is that? We're paying this man's salary to espouse these views? You think he only told Kathleen Bell, whom he just had met? You think he talked to his partners about it? You think his commanders knew about it? You think everybody knew about it and turned their heads? Nobody did anything about it? Things happen for a reason in your life. Maybe this is one of the reasons we're all gathered together here this day. One year and two days after we met. Maybe there's a reason for your purpose. Maybe this is why you were selected. There's something in your background and your character that helps you understand this is wrong. Maybe you're the right people at the right time, at the right place, to say no more. We're not gonna have this. This is wrong. What they've done to our client is wrong. This man, O.J. Simpson, is entitled to an acquittal. You cannot believe these people. You can't trust the message. You can't trust the messengers. It is frightening. It is quite frankly frightening, and it's not enough for the prosecutors now to stand up and say, oh, let's just back off. The point I was trying to make, they didn't understand that it's not just using the N-word. Forget that. We knew he was lying about that, forget that. It's about 
the lengths to which he would go to get somebody, black and also white, if they associated with black. That's pretty frightening. It's not just African Americans. It's white people who would associate or deign to go out with a black man or marry one. You're free in America to love whomever you want. So it infects all of us, doesn't it? This one rotten apple. And yet they cover for it. Yet they cover for it. And so, how do we do it? And what do we do with regard to this man? Well, we call some witnesses. And you recall these witnesses. And before I talk about these witnesses just briefly, and I'm going to include my remarks with regard to them, I indicated to you that by the nature of this case, uh, I'm going to pass the baton to Mr. Barry Sheck. You've been great from a standpoint of listening and watching, and I stayed longer than I planned to, but I hope you agree that some of these things were important. And I'll get one more time to conclude with a, some concluding remarks after Mr. Sheck finishes. The good news is that Mr. Sheck and I will both hopefully finish the day and turn it back over to Ms. Clark, so in a day or so, you're gonna get this case. You don't have to hear lawyers talk anymore. It'll be time to hear you talk. Time to hear you speak out. And I'll be happy, I'll, I'll relax tonight knowing that soon it's gonna be in your hands. We're real comfortable about that, all of us, and you should know that. So please give Mr. Sheck the attention to we, that you've given me and understand that all parts of this case are very important and it all ties together because it's all of the evidence in this case went through that LAPD and that black hole over there, that cesspool of contamination, and you listen to him about what he has to say in that regard. Mr. Darden said that in a textbook fashion, we had impeached Mr. Furman. Well, we thank him for that. We take no pride in that, but that's what did happen. In addition to calling Kathleen Bell where you saw her, and she's not the kind of lady that, you know, in looking at it, you probably remember her. Unless, you know, it'd be very interesting. You know he's lying about not knowing her. But this man used these words and these racial epithets so much, he probably can't remember who he said it to. He said it to everybody, whoever came in contact with him, on tape. Can you imagine the gall about that? That you would have these racist views, and yet you would put it on tape. Thank God he put it on tape. And so Kathleen Bell came in here and told you the same things in the, those letters. You saw her. You observed her. You know she told us the truth. They couldn't mess with her because now we had those tapes. And then there was Natalie Singer. Barely knew this man. He was dating her roommate. This man is an indiscriminate racist. He talks so bad that she didn't want him back in the house. What does he say to her? In her presence, the only good nigga is a dead nigga. Now that, probably all heard that expression sometime in your, in your background or somewhere, or heard somebody say that. And that's tremendously offensive. He just says it in the presence of his partner's girlfriend, like they're gonna go on a date. I mean, I hope that in the homes throughout this country, people aren't acting like this. This happened to come to light, but I'd be pretty frightened if I felt that the majority of people in this country acted like this behind closed doors or whatever, because what you do in the dark is gonna come to the light. Remember that, that's what this case is about. It came to the light, and just in time to get it to you. So you saw her on the stand, you saw her graphically. Talk about that. You doubt in anybody's mind she's telling you the truth? Any one of you think she's not telling you the truth? And then finally we had Roderick Hodge in this series of witnesses, and Roderick Hodge, intelligent young man, understood something about his rights too. Because when, after this run-in with Furman and his partner, when he's in the back of the police car, Furman turns around and says to him words that I want you to remember in this case. I told you, I get you, 
nigger. That's what he tells Rodney Hodge. Why is that important? Because from 1985, when he went on that one call involving the Mercedes, that was this man's mindset vis-a-vis O.J. Simpson. I'm gonna get that guy. And in 89, when he wrote that report, indelibly impressed on his mind, and in 94, he had his chance. Still in West Los Angeles, he had his chance. So Hodge is important because you can espouse all these epithets and talk theoretically about your racism, but when it's directed toward a human being. And I said to him, Mr. Hodge, tell this jury how that made you feel. He said it made me feel angry and upset and frustrated. It was dehumanizing in a free society. But this man, Furman, does it with impunity. And his partner sat there and heard it and didn't report it. There's something rotten about this kind of conduct. And it's gone on too long. And so, that's why he's important. But the capper was finding those tapes, something that you could hear, lest there be any doubt in anybody's mind. Laura McKinney came in here, and I can imagine the frustration of the prosecutors. They've had the glove demonstration. They've seen all these other things go wrong, and now they've got to face these tapes. And they didn't know how to handle her. Quite frankly, she was a reluctant witness. You know that. Mr. Darden asked her those questions where he became negative with her. But she's very smart. Unlike some others who didn't know how to handle it, she says, why are we having this negative conversation? Why are you acting and treating me like this? I didn't try to stop him about cover-ups and things. Why are you asking me these questions? I'm the one who's here under subpoena. Why are you treating me like this? Now, you know it's true because they've heard the tapes. Why are you messing with this lady? You just get so wrapped up in what you're doing, I guess. Why are they messing with this lady? We owe a debt of gratitude to this lady. That ultimately and finally she came forward and she tells us that this man, over the time of these interviews, uses the N-word 42 times, is what she says. In the so-called Furman tapes. And you, of course, had an opportunity to listen to this man and espouse this evil this personification of evil. And so I'm going to ask Mr. Harris to play Exhibit 1368 one more time. There was a transcript. This was not on tape. The tape had been erased. Where he said, we have no niggers where I grew up. These are two of 42, as you recall. And then there was his actual voice. This is the word text for what he then says in the tape. that voice, no question whose voice that is, Mr. Darden concedes whose voice that is. They don't do anything, talking about women, doesn't like them any better than he likes African Americans. They don't go out and initiate contact with some six foot five inch nigger who's been in prison pumping weights. That's how he sees the world. That's this man's cynical view of the world. That's this man who's out there protecting and serving us. That's Mark Furman. And he's paired in this case with Phil Van Adder. They're both beacons that you look at and look to as the messengers 
that you must look through and pass. They're both people who've shown that they lie, will lie, did lie, on the stand under oath. And you know, one little parenthetical thing, how these people all try to stick together from the standpoint of law enforcement. The FBI agent comes in here and he talks about, when I, when I bring out the fact he says that Van Etter says they're not there to save lives on cross-examination, he says, well, he says, um, I, I think he was being sarcastic, that Van Etter was being sarcastic, or maybe it was a joke. But you know, when I listened to that, I, I thought about that and I said, what, 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 what's, what's the joke? What, what's the sarcasm? Is the Constitution, this man's rights to be safe and secure in his home, is, is, that, is that the joke? Is that the sarcasm? It's a sad state of affairs. That's the lead detective I'm talking about. These two twin devils of deception. You think about them and keep them in mind. Thank you for your attention during this first part of my argument. I hope that during this phase of it, I have demonstrated to you that this really is a case about a rush to judgment, an obsession to win at all costs, a willingness to distort, twist, theorize in any fashion to try to get you to vote guilty in this case where it is not warranted, that these metaphors about an ocean of evidence or a mountain of evidence it's little more than a tiny, tiny stream, if at all, that points equally toward innocence. That any mountain has long ago been reduced to little more than a molehill under an avalanche of lies and complexity and com conspiracy. This is what we've shown you. And so, as great as America is, we have not yet reached the point where there's equality in rights or equality of opportunity. I started off talking to you a little bit about Frederick Douglass and what he said more than 100 years ago. For there are still the Mark Furmans in this world and in this country who hate and are yet embraced by people in power. But you and I, fighting for freedom and ideals and for justice for all, must continue to fight to expose hate and genocidal racism and these tendencies. We then become the guardians of the Constitution, as I told you yesterday. For if we as the people don't continue to hold a mirror up to the face of America, and say, this is what you promised, this is what you delivered. If you don't speak out, if you don't stand up, if you don't do what's right, this kind of conduct will continue on forever. And we'll never have an ideal society, one that lives out the true meaning of the creed of the Constitution, of life, liberty, and justice for all. I'm going to take my seat, but I get one last time to address you, as I said before. This is a case about an innocent man wrongfully accused. You've seen him now for a year and two days. You observed him through the good times and the bad times. Soon, It'll be your turn. You have the keys to his future. You have the evidence by which you can acquit this man. You have not only the patience, but the integrity and the courage to do the right thing. We believe you'll do the right thing. And the right thing is to find this man not guilty of both of these charges. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate your attention. I think, Your Honor, we may need a brief break because he has to be... Exhibit. Judge. Yes.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll take a 15-minute uh, recess at this time. Remember all my admonitions to you. We'll see you back here in 15 minutes. All right, we'll stand in recess.